Hey, what's up, St. Teresa? My name is Chase Krause, and welcome to this week's episode of The Ark. All right, y'all, so our first reading for this Sunday comes from 2 Chronicles. So we read, In those days, all the princes of Judah, the priests and the people, added infidelity to infidelity, practicing all the abominations of the nations and polluting the Lord's temple, which he had consecrated to in Jerusalem. Early and often did the Lord, the God of their fathers, send his messengers to them, for he had compassion on his people and his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his warnings, and scoffed at his prophets, until the anger of the Lord against his people was so inflamed that there was no remedy. Their enemies burnt the house of God, tore down the walls of Jerusalem, set all its palaces afire, and destroyed all its precious objects. Those who escaped the sword were carried captive to Babylon, where they became servants of the king of the Chaldeans and his sons, until the kingdom of the Persians came to power. All this was to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. Until the land has retrieved its lost Sabbaths, during all the time it lies waste, it shall have rest, while seventy years are fulfilled. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord inspired King Cyrus of Persia to issue this proclamation throughout his kingdom, both by word of mouth and in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given to me. And he has also charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever therefore among you belongs to any part of his people, let him go up and may his God be with him. All right, so just a quick note about 1 and 2 Chronicles. A lot of scholars actually believe now that this actually was one big book instead of like two books. Uh, But also more importantly, I think, is the fact that this is more of a liturgical or theological view of the history of Israel. So when you read First and Second Kings, that's more of an exact, they're trying to just record literal history. And in First and Second Chronicle, while there is a lot of literal history, so this event literally happened with the king of Persia, it also has a lot of theological inputs into it and a theological reading of history from the viewpoint of the writers who were Jewish. So I think a lot of people, they ask themselves, you know, why the Old Testament ended the way it did? You know, why would an all loving God allow Israel to be sacked and destroyed and his people taken off into exile, right? Well, we have the answer here actually in, in, in second Corinthians quoting the prophet Jeremiah until the land has retrieved its lost Sabbaths during all the time it lies waste. It shall have rest while 70 years are fulfilled. So, Here's the deal. Israel, the nation of Israel, every seven years was supposed to be a Sabbath year. Now we know that on the seventh day was supposed to be a day of rest, a Sabbath day, but actually in the Old Testament, it commands every seven years is a Sabbath year where it's a year of rest and of jubilation in the Lord. And seven times seven is 49. That's why on the 50th year, it's the year of jubilee, right? It's a year of where all the captives are set free. But Israel didn't take up this seven-year Sabbath. Why? Well, I think it's kind of obvious. Could you imagine not working for a year and what that would do to your income, your family, your economy? It's kind of a a terrifying thing, right? It's a terrifying thought not to work for a year. And it requires a lot of trust in God. And so most Israelites didn't rest on that seventh year. And in, in the book of Deuteronomy, which is a covenant contract, What happens when you break the covenant is exile from the land, as we read in the book of Deuteronomy. And so Israel, knowing the contract, broke the contract, broke the covenant. The next kind of crazy thing about this reading is that in the Old Testament, particularly this passage, God allowed a pagan king who believed in multiple gods to build his temple, to release the captives and to enact his will. I think this is just one way God wanted to, to, one, humble his people, but also to show them that he isn't just the God of one nation and there's multiple gods elsewhere vying for the, the love of other people. But no, he is the only God, Gentile or Greek, pagan or Jew, like we read in the New Testament. One God 
who's Lord of all, the only true God. Let's turn now to our first set of family discussion questions. All right, so our second reading comes from Ephesians 2. Brothers and sisters, God, who is rich in mercy, because of the great love he had for us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, brought us to life with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not from you. It is the gift of God. It is not from works. So no one may boast for we are his handiwork created in Christ Jesus for the good works that God has prepared in advance that we should live in them. All right. So this is like a super like crazy theologically deep passage. We don't have time to get on to the nuts and bolts, but I do want to say a few things that are really, really, really important. Uh, The first thing that's going to help us kind of read this passage is that the word grace and the word gift have the same root in Greek. So when Paul's readers would have heard the word and read it, they would have understand grace and gift go hand in hand. This is what I want to talk about just really, really briefly is this idea of, you know, grace, faith, works, salvation, all this kind of stuff, right? So basically, I'll give you like the, the boundary markers with the church set. The church has never defined how salvation works because quite honestly, it can't. Unless some kind of crazy special revelation from Jesus comes before the end of time, the church has never attempted to, church proper, uh, attempted to like straight up write out how salvation works. But it does give boundary markers that, that say, no, it's neither of these two things, it's somewhere in the middle. The boundary marker on the, let's say left, we'll call it, is what we'll call Pelagianism. So it's the heresy of Pelagianism. And this is the heresy that says that we take the first step to God. And then after God sees our first step towards loving and serving him, that's when we receive grace. But the church says, no, 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 no. We know from scripture, we know from experience that it's always God that takes the first step, not us. Okay, so we know that's not it. The other end of the spectrum, we have high Calvinism. So a high Calvinism says that it's all God and none of us, right? You either saved or condemned. You have no say in the matter. Sorry, God just has a lever or a springboard and go one way or the other. You have no say. Well, the church says, well, no, that's not, that's not right either, right? So we know that it's not Pelagianism, that we don't take the first step, that it's all gift, it's all grace. At the same time, we know that we cooperate in some mysterious way. So, you know, there's different orders within the church that have tried to lean one way or the other and all these things. Uh, I prefer St. Thomas Aquinas' definition, so look that bad boy up if you don't. But just in summary, he'll say that we have been saved through faith, like St. Paul says, and it's the primacy of grace through faith, right? That God takes the first step. And then after we have received this grace through faith, through our belief, both intellectual and our loyalty, that we then respond to the gift of grace by serving him, by serving our brothers and sisters. Just as a side, you know, Paul says here that we're not saved by works, but within the text of Paul, works, when he says works, he means ceremonial works of the law, right? So things like circumcision, calendar law, dietary restrictions, those are ceremonial works of the law. He says those are not what save you. Like a lot of Jews thought, they thought those things were the things that were going to save them. And Paul says, no, 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 no. Those ceremonial works, that was just a way to, you know, separate us from the pagans. That wasn't, they didn't actually really have merit in and of itself necessarily. So it's our response to the grace given by God that we are saved. We cooperate with grace. It's not just all God. It's not all us. We're, it's somewhere in the middle here. I know that's a lot. It's really deep. It's kind of crazy. It's really a hard subject. If you want to read more about this, just let me know. I got a ton of books because I'm a nerd like that. So anyway, let's dive into our next set of family discussion questions. All right, y'all. So the gospel today is from John 3. Jesus said to Nicodemus, 
Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe has already been condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the verdict, that the light came into the world, but people preferred darkness to the light because their works were evil. Everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come towards the light so that his works might not be exposed. But whoever lives the truth comes to the light so that his works may be clearly seen as done in God. So this is arguably the most famous passage in the entire Bible, right? So that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. You see it on like a football, football fields, you know, John 3, 16, right? Um, it's a beautiful passage. I actually really encourage you, and you'll see this on the family discussion questions, just like read through that passage again, like slowly as a family and just like, just go through it with a fine tooth comb. It's, it's, just such a beautiful passage. Not, not even looking at the theology and all these things, but just, just the wording of it, right? When Because this is within the Gospel of John, and this is one of those places in the Gospel of John where John isn't writing a history. He's like commenting on the thing that he just wrote about, right? Um, so namely, he's commenting on this conversation that Jesus just had with Nicodemus. And you can just, you can just kind of almost see it, right? Where he, he's writing down what happened. He's writing down the Gospel. And then all of a sudden, you know, he gets inspired by the Holy Spirit and just starts writing like, dude, because God so loved the world that he gave his only son that we may be saved through him. Um, and so it's just a beautiful passage. As you can tell, I really love it. Um, but a few things I do want to say kind of later on in the passage is, you know, throughout the Gospel of John, we have this, these images of light versus dark, right? We have, this is a very obvious image in, in the Gospel of John and also in the letters of John as well. And so what happens? Well, according to John, the ultimate punishment for not believing in Jesus is your unbelief in Jesus. Because nothing is greater than knowing and loving the Lord. Nothing will ever bring you more joy and satisfaction than loving God through his only son, Jesus Christ. And so unbelief, man, that's punishment in and of itself. The next thing he says is, People prefer darkness to the light. We have to ask, you know, why, why is that a reality? Why do people prefer uh, darkness to the light? Well, for John, it's because if they're exposed to the light, they have to confront themselves, their own ego, their own mistakes. And people don't want to do that because it's uncomfortable and it can be painful. But John's inviting us to, to enter into the light of Jesus Christ, to enter into his truth and his love. And I hope as a family this Lent, you can do that even more than you're already doing. So let's go into our last set of family discussion questions. All right, St. Teresa, I hope you're having a great Lent so far. Thanks so much for joining me this week on The Ark. See you next time. God bless.